thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of serving you. Even though none of us, when we knelt and when we prayed, realized how much suffering there might be, what a heavy load the cross could be. None of us imagined that in serving you with gladness, our hearts would be shattered many times. We had no idea we could not conceive of the fact that there would be days in this thing called the joy of the Lord that the joy would seem to evaporate and the darkness and the depths of despair would seem to be our dwelling place. But we thank you today that for every flame of fire, you were there to protect us. And when we were in the deepest, lowest, darkest place, we spoke your name and you said, I am here. And we thank you that when the cross got so heavy, we didn't think we could carry it another step. You touched our bodies, our minds, and our spirits and reminded us you carried it for us, which gave us the strength to carry it for you. So I'm asking you today, Lord, fill us every one with the Holy Spirit to the place we realize that only the strong get attacked. And may we understand that meaning, that, that statement. Lord, when we are meaningless to the devil, he's not going to attack us. But when we start growing in grace and knowledge and when we become a threat to hell, that's when hell is unleashed against us. So for every man whose heart is broken today, may he realize the Lord God has made him strong. For every woman in this place today who feels like throwing up her hands and screaming at the top of her lungs, may she realize the Lord Almighty is here. You are present in this time. And now I ask this wonderful God, this holy, righteous Creator who is my Father, help me today to preach, Jesus, what you would preach if you were standing here right now. And I do believe you have heard these prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 I want you to, before you're seated, join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't know how far I'll get. With, with all of this. You know when you're preparing, praying, seeking God, it's, uh, it's labor. You don't just throw words together. You don't just pull out a piece of paper and drop, jot down some notes and say, yippee. Uh, this, is, this is laborious. This is uh, preparation to deliver truth. It's, it's a taxing responsibility. I don't know how far I'll get with this today. But I want somebody to get something that will alert you to the fact that Jesus Christ is at the door. And our life is nothing but a vapor. I watched a cup of coffee I made yesterday. I say I watched it. I put it down and when I turned around to get something else, I saw the steam coming out. And in just a couple of minutes, there was no more steam. That's your life, and that's my life. And it could be over at any moment. And my concern and my call is to make sure that every one of you today listening and watching, every one of you is ready when your time comes. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 14. Join me if you will. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. 
as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Thank you for being seated. If I had time, I would stop as we read each verse and, and just ask you, what does that mean to you? How does that apply to you? I will do it on this seventh verse. Since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all, all filthiness of the flesh. What does that mean to you as a believer? Because that's the audience he was writing to, believers. Let us, it's my job, it's my responsibility. Let Loran Livingston cleanse himself from all filthiness of my flesh and spirit, perfecting, working at holiness in the fear of God. Holiness in the fear of God. I've said this a number of times recently. We have grown too comfortable with God. I've said this many times recently. In the Pentecostal environment, it is easier to become too comfortable with God because we begin to treat uh, gifts of the Spirit and emotional responses to the Spirit uh, with lightness and, and the heaviness of that there's a holy God among us uh, kind of uh, is frittered away because we are enjoying what we feel so much. You know, you can adjust to anything. We are built to adjust. We can adjust, adjust to any type of noise, whether it be too loud or just too aggravating, after a while, you can uh, grow, grow accustomed to it and it doesn't irritate you anymore. You can adjust to pain. There are people sitting here today who are in great physical pain, but they're here because they've adjusted somewhat to it and have overcome it at least to be able to come to church and sit on a pew. If you will... Uh, recall the Israelites adjusted to the power and holiness of a God who sent ten plagues to deliver them from bondage and then opened an ocean for them to cross on dry land and then saw water flow out of a rock, enough water to water people and animals up into the millions. Uh, people who watched holy heavenly bread fall from heaven and they ate it every day. But if you follow them, they are now so familiar with God and, and have grown so accustomed to seeing all of these miraculous things that they're not moved anymore. And they start murmuring and complaining not about what he did then, but what he's not doing now. And I've come to tell this church that it's very possible that we have grown accustomed to God. We're used to it. We're used to Bible preaching and good singing. We're used to all these 
Christian things to the point that they may not stir and, and I've said before, sting us anymore. There's no conviction. There's no self-searching and, and examining of our hearts when we hear the scriptures or when we're moved by the Holy Ghost. We just kind of take it, we enjoy it, or we mull it for a moment, and then we forget it and go on. And there's a danger there that Paul brings out to the young Pastor Timothy. He said there are some people who have seared consciences now, that they have seen it all and heard it all and ignored it all for so long that their consciences are not capable of being torn up or arrested by the Holy Spirit anymore. They have become insensitive to spiritual things. And I'll say it again. They're too familiar with the divine. And the scary part of that to me is I study the Bible every day, many hours every day, is that I read in Romans chapter 3, uh, the prophets telling us that people who have fallen away from God and have no desire for God, also have no fear of God anymore. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And when you lose the knee-knocking reverence for a holy God, and he becomes just another factor in your equation of life, and, and God is the one that gives you what you want. And God is the one that gets you out of trouble. And God is the one about whom you read and all of your little devotional booklets and pamphlets only. Then there is a danger of, of losing that sense that I'm going to stand before a holy God one day and I will answer every question he asks me about how I lived on this earth and how I used my language, my mouth, my tongue, my thought. What did I do with my eyes? There's this sense of a, a nonchalance even as we now think of dying and standing one day before the judgment seat of Christ. I tell you, brother... The more I pray and study and the more I age, that's a scary thing to me. And I've been washed in the blood and I know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But I had to go in front of an auditor one time, Sandra and I did. Uh, they said we didn't look right. Our, our charitable giving was too high for what we were making. And we had all the records and all the cancel checks and all the proof and yet when he said come meet me on a certain day I just got sweaty because I don't trust what they see I know what I see but I don't know what they see and if, and if I felt that way about standing in front of a mortal man when I had proof in my hand how much more should I be trembling in my guts to think about standing in front of God Almighty, Jesus, the judge of all the earth, who sees my heart, who knows why I do everything I do. He knows me better than I know myself. I can't stand and defend myself in front of him. Let me tell you, brother, you won't have a chance to defend yourself when you stand before Jesus. And I'm talking to believers right now. I'm talking to people who ought to be getting ready and getting their house in order to stand before the judge of all the earth. If I feel that way about a man down here judging me, now I'm saying it again, to think of standing alone and looking up at brightness like I've never seen and holiness like I can't comprehend and know that his eyes are looking right through me and he knows everything about me. Oh, how I should be preparing my heart. Oh, how I should take all of this deep inside of me. Oh, how I should seek holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How I ought to be 
cleansing myself of fleshliness and, and washing my spirit from worldliness, living in the word and living on my knees because I, there is a day coming when every one of us is going to do just what I said. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the life we have lived. But when you lose your fear of God, there is another danger. Let me give you some examples. When, when you see it so much and you're so used to it, you, a sense of uh, urgency and holiness. I'm stammering today a little bit. It's not because I'm old. It's because I've asked the Lord to help me weigh my words. I want to be careful. I don't want to just blurt stuff out. I want to be careful and guard what I say today because this is eternal stuff. When you get used to God, you are more apt to sin against God. Nadab and Abihu, they went into the temple and this was people who saw the miracle working power of God. They heard the voice. They watched mountains shake. They saw it all. And in the process, God appointed them, the two sons of Aaron, to manage the worship in the tabernacle. But only certain other Levites were to touch and deal with the fire of God that burned day and night. But it's implied, and I mean that I believe this now, later down, that they became intoxicated. They became too uh, liberated with alcohol. I'm going to say this again, and I'm going to preach it harder than I've ever preached it. Alcohol and God don't mix. Alcohol and drugs and holiness do not mix. It'll take away your sense of godliness and your sense of self-control and you'll find yourself in a bind with the Holy One. And so Nadab and Abihu said, hey, the fire's going out. I don't know where the other guys are. Let's build another fire. Let's create a fire. And the Bible says they offered strange fire to God and God killed them right there on the spot. Now, what's the problem with that? They were making sure the temple was kept. You see, when God tells you something, he means it. When God says don't do it, he means don't do it. There are no exceptions. When he says do it, he means do it. There are no exceptions. And they had become too familiar with God and thought, well, we'll just go in and do what God told us not to do. We're working for him so he understands. Same thing with Uzzah. When the the Ark of the Covenant was being carried on the wooden cart and the Bible said the oxen stumbled and it looked like the Ark of the Covenant, that holy box, was going to fall to the ground and Uzzah reached out to steady it. Well, that makes sense to me. I wouldn't want that holy thing to hit the ground and break. So he reached up to steady it and God killed him right on the spot. Why? Because God doesn't make exceptions. Because you're in the choir, there is no exception. Uh, because you teach Sunday school. Because I preach. God doesn't make exceptions with me. Nobody gets a pass. When God says, don't do it, you better not do it. Or you'll pay the price. I, you can whine and moan about how much you love him. You just didn't want the ark to fall off. And God said, but I told you not to touch it. And then you come to the New Testament and you got some people now so familiarized and accustomed to the working of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the Word, being around the apostles, that they thought they could do a sinful thing and get, and get away with it. Ananias and Sapphira. They thought that they could still be involved in church ministry and be thieves. They could lie about their income. They, they had a lie living in them and they thought it doesn't matter. We're born again and we're with the apostles and we're working for the ministry. Uh, but God doesn't allow anybody to get away with anything. And when they lied, God struck them dead right there on the spot. I think it was Ananias first or his wife first and then Ananias came in. 
But both husband and wife were wiped off the face of the planet because they thought God understands. We are pals with God. They forgot he was a holy God that lives in an unapproachable light. He also dwells in thick darkness and no man is able to come to him without the shedding of blood and without the representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God is, is holy. Everything about him is holy. Everybody that comes to him must be holy or there is a consequence to be paid. You know, um, I look around as a pastor of a church and I see people aging in this church. I do. I'm aging myself. And as I uh, pondered yesterday, uh, those thieves on the cross beside Jesus, one railed at Jesus and said, if you're king, why don't you save, the, save us too? Save yourself and save us. That other criminal said, man, do you not fear God? And I started adding a little bit to that. I thought he might have said, you mean you're at the end of your life and you still have no fear of God? You're hanging on this cross and in just a matter of hours, you're going to leave this world and go into eternity and you're talking like that? These are your actions? This is how you plan to leave this world? Do you not fear God? I would stand here as this, a pastor of this church and I would say to somebody, because I know somebody needs to hear this. I've been knowing this for weeks that God is doing some rooting out and some pulling down and some tearing up around here. He's trying to get us ready. The judgment of God has begun at the house of God. And I would say to some of you, you mean you're this close to leaving this world and you're still living like that? That's what you want for your life. That's how you think and talk and live. And you are, you are one step away from going into eternity. Do you not fear God? If I were you, I would not be able to eat or sleep until I had fallen on my face before God and cried out for the mercy of God. Don't do me like Ananias and Sapphira, Lord. Take the lie out of my heart. Don't do me like you did us, Lord. Don't let me think I can get away with it. Don't let me be foolish like Nadab and Abihu. Wake me up and let me realize that my time on earth is limited and I'm going to stand before you you see, when you don't fear God, I said you are more apt to sin against God. This is a true story. A number of years ago, a minister came up to me. Now, I know this minister. Uh, I had known him for many years. He pastored a church here in this state. But he um, loved golf. And so one day I ran into him. He said, man... I just joined the best club right across the line in South Carolina. I'm a member there now. I'll take you with me sometime. And I said, that's great. I said, but wait a minute. Don't you have to be a resident of South Carolina to join that club? He said, they, they're not going to check your address. I just put down a false address. I'm a member. What's the big deal? I said, okay. Okay, here's the big deal. There was a man living a lie. He told a lie. He was going to get in the pulpit and preach the truth, but he had a lie in his heart. And for some reason, he was not convicted by that. He had gotten too close to God, too comfortable with God. He was not afraid of God. He did not respect this austere creator he had. He was preaching as a profession. He had nothing in him that made him tremble in the presence of God. I don't know where he is today. I haven't heard about him or from him for a long, long time. But I'm telling you, brother, when he told me that, I got sick on my stomach. And I said a silent prayer. Dear God, please don't ever let me allow my heart to get into that kind of condition that I could tell a lie and not be stung by it and then think that you're okay with it. You don't have to clap. See, even though you're warned repeatedly, and that's about all I do these days. Have you noticed? I warn people. 
People just say, I'll, I'll confess it and go on. Well, I sinned, great, you know, big deal. I'll confess it and go on. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And Of course, that's true. But John is not talking about a, a cool attitude towards the demands of God. He's not talking about uh, saying, hey, I did it, big deal. Forgive me, Lord, and go on. Um, and, and it seems like Christians these days have the attitude, well, you know, we're going to sin the rest of our lives. That's just the way it is. Uh, it's in us. In my flesh dwells no good thing. So everybody does it. And men, a lot of times, men will say, you know, I just see it and I think it and that's the way it is and I'll always be a man. I, I'm going to take issue with some of this today. You know, when you say, that's just the way it is. Couldn't you at least be upset about it? Couldn't you at least mourn over the fact that your heart doesn't hurt about it anymore and your conscience doesn't arrest you anymore? At least show some grief that you are falling short of the holiness of God. At least be upset that your flesh and your spirit are being infused with the thoughts of a dark world. That's why James said, why not just be afflicted? Don't just take it. Don't just excuse yourself, sir. Ma'am, don't just say it's in me. It's the way I am. James said, why don't you mourn? Why don't you let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into heaviness? Why don't you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and then the Lord will lift you up? Ladies and gentlemen, I can't preach any deeper from my heart than I'm preaching right now. There needs to be a, an awakening in our congregation about the fact that this kind of service can soothe a sinner's conscience. This kind of worship can palliate a very ugly and sinful thing. We can feel something and think that that's the spirit of the living God when it's nothing but flesh being appeased. So I come to you today and I say, could you not at least be upset about the fact that you've given yourself permission to break the law of God, to disturb the Holy Spirit that abides in you. Why, why couldn't you pick up your Bible like David did? See, David never said, I can't do this. It's too hard. It's impossible because he knew it was without the help of God. At, at least David said something like this. Lord, teach me your statutes and I will keep them. Then he said, give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Then he said, make me walk in the path of your commandments. Then he said, incline my heart to your testimonies. And then he said, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Don't you see the appeal David was making to God? He said, God, I'm in a bad place right now. It doesn't seem like I can change. I can't cleanse myself. So I'm calling on you, my maker. Make me love you. Teach me how to walk with you. Put a heart in me that's hungry for your holiness. God can do that. God will do that. If we mean business enough with God, he's able to do a new thing in our heart. Oh, God, teach us to hate sin. I'm praying right now in the middle of a message, teach us to hate sin like the plague. Teach us to hate sin because it keeps us from knowing you fully and completely with joy every day. Make me hate sin, oh, Lord. For those of you that say, that's just the way it is. I'm going to sin till I die. 
then you got to help me with this verse right here. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Can anybody say God's faithful? But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that that you are able to bear. But with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what he said. Now, brother, in my life, there have been times I had to literally run for my life. Get away from it, I ran. There are other times I had to fall on my face and scream out to God for strength. But nevertheless, Paul is writing to say, it's not God's will for you to sin all the time. It's not God's will for you to give yourself permission to sin all the time. You're going to be tempted. It's always going to be in front of you. But if you'll stop looking in front of you and look behind you, you'll see a door has been opened. A way of escape has been made for you to run through it and live a life that's pleasing to God. Stand with me, please. I want us to read one last verse together. Stephen, if you'll put up Acts 9, 31. Don't look at it yet. Please look at me. Thank you. The church is in the midst of persecution here. Terrible persecution. Times are tough. <clears throat> the people could have been greatly disturbed to the point of disappointment, to the point of quitting. They could have. Uh, that's what's going on in our country right now, in the Christian community. I will say this. I hope it doesn't make anybody too mad. I think we're more afraid of getting sick than we are sinning against God. If we had the same kind of fear, about sinning against God as we have about COVID, whether you talk about holy power, we'd have it. If we were as conscientious about putting a mask over our eyes, our heart, our ears, so that we might not sin against Him, oh, you talk about a revival that would begin to sweep this city. And so that's why I say we are much more sensitive about getting sick than we are being sinful. They had every occasion in that place in the Word to be discouraged, to quit, to stay home, to go back to Judaism or whatever they did. But they had the key to it. Want to know what it is? Read with me. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit they were multiplied do you see do you see that verse they walked in the fear of the Lord they weren't afraid of Rome they weren't afraid of the centurions or Herod they feared the Lord. They understood what Jesus meant when he said, you don't have to worry about men that can kill you, your body, but you better worry about the one who's able to cast your body and soul into hell. And they walked in the fear of the Lord. Guess what happened next? And the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I am here to declare to you the best I know how. When a great fear for God and of God overtakes us, we'll find ourselves more peaceful and comforted than we've ever been. When we get back to the place that we tremble. But ladies and gentlemen, after Moses had seen all he had seen, the Red Sea and all of that, when God started shaking that mountain, Moses said, I do exceedingly fear and tremble. He wasn't used to God. He'd seen a lot, but 
Every time God moved, it shook him up again. Here's what I'm praying right now. I cannot see the balcony. I can't see very many of you because of these lights. Don't close your eyes. But I'm going to pray a prayer. And this prayer is, Almighty God, Father, Holy Spirit, would you strike fear in the heart of your church once again? Would you make us afraid to sin? Would you make us so sick of sin that we flee it? Holy God of heaven, you who cannot tolerate it, nor will you accept it, holy God of heaven, will you move on our hearts and draw us to our knees? And will you multiply the levels and the fear of God? And would you make us as fearful of sin because we know it will destroy us. If I can get an amen. amen. Do you really want this church? Amen. Here's the bottom line. Fear God and quit sinning. Whatever's in your heart and it's not right, get it out. Get it out! Doesn't matter what you have to do, what price you have to pay, what sacrifice you have to make. Get it out of your life. God is no more tolerant today of sin than he was then. And the only reason any of us will get to heaven is because God is looking at his beautiful son, Jesus, who now has covered us with his blood and lives in us. Can I get an amen from the church of the living God? I want to close. I'd like to preach an hour here. I heard another silly person in a silly service. And I mentioned this the other Sunday, but it rings in my mind. I don't know why I'm this way. It just goes over and over and over in my mind. And this silly woman said, Lord Jesus, we just thank you today. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my gosh. You're so much fun. And it made me sick. Then I heard another silly woman say, when you get up tomorrow, just raise your hands and say, I am the best thing God's going to have all day long. I am God's delight. That's heresy, my brother. Let me tell you what you ought to be saying. Lord, you are my delight. I delight in you today. I serve you today. You're the best thing that will happen to me today. Hallelujah! Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. Tomorrow night at 7, we pray. Be blessed. This could be the day you see Jesus.